morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so very glad to see you, whether you're joining us in person or online. My name is Seth. This is The Foundry, where we're all about a better you and a better world. So we are going through this series, this series that we're calling Party. And what we're doing is we're looking at the parable of uh, the lost son, the lost sons, the prodigal son, the parable of the loving father. I think the prodigal son is probably the worst name for that one, by the way. And we're looking at it from different perspectives. So last week we looked at it from the perspective of the younger son and we got into a lot of like really deep, interesting, probably too much stuff. And that was kind of just scratching the surface. So this week we're gonna look at this story from the perspective of the father and see what it is we can learn through that, okay? So let's start again. Oh, again, the same thing. Uh, <laughs> Luke 15, verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he defi- divided his property between them. Okay, now we're pausing right there. Uh, last week we talked about how shocking of an opening statement this was. Because essentially this request of the youngest son is to say to his father, I wish that you were dead. Because this is the only way the inheritance passes on. And so this would have been like, people listening to this would have been kind of dumbfounded with how ridiculous this is. So from the father's perspective, immediately, I'm thinking about like how difficult this would have been for the father, right? Like if this is what that request means, then as a dad, this is just like a dagger in the heart. Have you ever had your kids tell you they hate you and wish you were dead? Don't answer that out loud. Um, We do have counselors in the back if you're still like wrestling through all of that. Like like that's pretty brutal stuff. And here's the thing, we're not even given any indicators as to why the son might feel this way. Like we're just stepping into the middle of the family drama, right? Anybody dealing with family drama? Don't answer that one anyways. Um, It's like this stuff, family drama stuff has been happening since like the beginning of the story, isn't it? Like Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, like apparently that's just a part of how things go. So I I can't imagine the hurt and the pain of the father here. I'm sure this was tough for him to hear or or, or to feel. Like, you know, um, last week my my sons were at camp for for a few days and they came back from camp and, you know, I was missing them because, you know, after like three days you kind of miss them takes about that long to, so anyways, so I'm kind of missing them, and they show back up, and, and, and they get into the driveway, and I'm excited to see them, and so I walk out to the car, and I'm like, <sighs> like waiting for the hugs, and the kisses, and the we love you dads, and they pile out of the car, and my son walks by me, and he goes, hey dad, and I was like, what, what is that all about, like come give your dad a hug, and he goes, yeah, but I'm, I'm kind of tired, and I was like, get your butt here, and give your dad a hug, and so he came and hugged me. So it wasn't really that big of a deal. I mean, it kind of killed a part of my soul, but other than that, like, he still gave me a hug, right? So when I, when I read this story, and I think about this father whose son essentially tells him, I wish you were dead, I think, oh man, that would be, that would be like a, a really tough one, wouldn't it? Like, I imagine the father was filled with hurt, sadness, pain, frustration, yeah, all, all of the feelings. We are given a little indication here, though, that I find fascinating, that regardless of whatever it was that the father was feeling, the way that he responded to that anger or to that request or to the feelings he was having is that he responds with generosity and love, right? He, he grants the son's request. He divides the property, which we learned last week, like the son, like this request would would never be made to begin with. And secondly, if this request was made, that at the time, the response would be like to beat the kid for being disrespectful, for being rude, for being obnoxious. The father would more than likely beat him. But this father responds with love and generosity, and he grants the request. Now, if this was an actual situation, right, at this time and at this place, and not just a parable, there was, there was actually a lot of stuff concerning the legality of how a transaction like this might actually take place. We, we don't have time for all of it, but there is one thing that I wanna point out that highlights the Father's love and generosity. There was rabbinic legislation at this time that stated that a man could give, could assign his property to his sons as a gift. Okay, like legally they could go through this process. Um, but the, the catch was that, is that the son really couldn't do anything with it. They couldn't sell it, couldn't trade it, couldn't do whatever until the father actually passed away, right? So the father could give this as a gift, 
but it wasn't valid unless it was a voluntary act if it was free will, if the father wasn't under duress. So essentially there's this law in place that says, that prevents like the kids from bullying the father into giving them their inheritance early. So in this parable, the younger son demands the father give him his share of the inheritance, which means that the father is essentially under duress. So in this situation, the father, all the father has to do is admit that he's being pressured by the son and legally that like, would, would be void. Legally, he could prevent this from happening and the son would get nothing, right? So either way, the father has the power to prevent this from happening. He could just say, no, I'm your dad. You're being an idiot. Stop it. I'm not doing that. Or he could legally say, no, I'm being pressured. Therefore, they could not sign over the, the property. He, he could prevent this from happening, which means that like from a legal perspective in this situation, in order for it to happen, he must act as if it was his decision to give away the property to the son in order to allow the son to happen, have it. Which means that like that little phrase, so he divided his property between them, it actually has a lot of implications. And that from the very beginning of the story, what we see is the deep love of the father being put on display. It's like this whole story is set in the context of this extremely deep pre-existing love. Now let's fast forward to the son's return because we talked about all that last week. This week we're looking at the father, the son's return. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Now remember what we said that when the son asked for his inheritance and skipped town, he's essentially damaged these three key relationships. Relationship with his father, relationship with his brother, relationship with the community, okay? The, there's this Jewish scribe by the name of Ben Sarah. He was writing like 200 years before Jesus. He, he talks about how there are four things that terrify him about like, um, like in the Jewish community. He says one of those is uh, the ridicule or slander of a village, and the other is the gathering of a mob. Okay, so when the son comes home, when, when he finally comes home, he is actually going to end up facing two of these terrifying things. When he shows up at the edge of the village and people start to see him and he's identified, when they realize who he is, they're going to begin to gather around him. And because of how he's treated the father and because the village would be upset at his disrespect to his father, they would probably like have, there's the potential there for like physical violence as well. So he's going to be, like subjected to those two terrifying things, the slander of the whole village and possibly like with this gathering of the mob, this sort of physical violence, right? Like this is a pretty intense situation going into this thing. Like this would not be taken lightly by the people there, by the village. So when you look at this homecoming scene, this whole thing that's about to take place, this whole scene is a series of intentional and calculated actions taken by the father who is looking to protect his son from the hostility of the village and to restore him within the community. Everything from this point on is highly significant, okay? It all starts with the father running. It all starts with the running. It says he saw him, he was filled with compassion for him, he started running, he throws his arms around him, and he kisses him. Okay, at this time and at this place, like, adult men do not run. <laughs> and all the adult men said, amen. Um, it was undignified. It was humiliating for a man to run in public. The, the Middle Eastern mindset is, is that what is, it was undignified for an older man to run. Aristotle says, great men never run in public. Now, I do a fair amount of running in public, so I don't know what that says about me, but I feel like I take offense, or I should. So Jesus says, first of all, the father was filled with compassion. It's like he knew what his son was about to face, what he was walking into, the, the, the jeering, the taunting, the pushing, the shoving. He knew what his son was about to face as he entered into the village and he's filled with compassion for him. The word compassion in the Greek text is, is, is awesome. It's the word splegnizomai, and it means to, uh, to have the bowels yearn. So it's feeling sympathy, it's pity. It's literally like this stirring of the guts. 
So the father sees the son in the distance, and he has a stirring in his guts, knowing what his son is about to face, and he runs to him. He does this undignified, humiliating thing. He humiliates himself in front of the rest of the village in order to get to his son, in order to protect his son. This is a, this is a powerful story, just right here. And then it says he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. A couple of things about this, the kiss. The kiss is a sign of, of, uh, of forgiveness. It's a sign of reconciliation. Uh, one of the ancient uh, village customs was if there was two men that were having a quarrel and everybody knew about it, eventually they would come to a place of having a like, reconciliation ceremony. When they went through that process, the way one of the aspects of that ceremony was that the two men would kiss publicly, like to let everybody know that we have forgiven and we are reconciled. So, so the kiss is, is a huge deal. So the son returns. The father is filled with compassion for him. He runs to him. He embraces him. And he kisses him publicly as a sign of forgiveness and reconciliation. And think about this. This is all before the son has a chance to ask for forgiveness. He hasn't even repented yet. And think about this too. From the son's perspective, he's planning on coming home and being hired, like hired as a, as a servant, as a hired worker. And so if I'm approaching my father after I think I've done wrong or whatever it is, how am I going to approach that? I'm probably going to approach in like a, like, like a lowly type of posture, attempt to kiss my father's hand, maybe put myself at his feet, maybe kiss his feet. He's on his way to do this and the father cuts him off. The father hugs him. The father kisses him before he even repents. That's really weird and interesting. What does that say to us about the love of the Father? The Father makes this gesture of public reconciliation while the Son is a long way off, while he's at the edge of the village, and by doing so, the Son now enters the village under the protection and the care of the Father's love and acceptance. So rather than experiencing the judgment and the hostility that the son may have expected upon his return, the son witnesses this unexpected, visible demonstration of the great lengths that the father is willing to go through in order to show him love. I mean, we could almost stop right there, couldn't we? Like this alone would be enough if we stopped right here. Like what more do we need to know about the love of the father? The whole story is rooted in this pre-existing love. And then we see this love in action right before our eyes. Now, the son goes into his like, forgiveness speech, which remember we talked about how that was like the form of re like, how the rabbis understood repentance. He says, I've sinned against heaven and against God. And then we see the father cut him off. He doesn't get to finish it. It says this. But the father said to his servants, bring, uh, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Let's stop there for a second. Because these three things are also highly significant, right? The best robe, the, the, the ring, the sandals. These are all sending a message. The instruction here of the father when the shun shows up is not, hey, you should go bathe and get changed and then we'll have a discussion about whether or not we want you to be a part of this family and if I understand that your heart is proper and... Right, think about this kid. He's been destitute, living like with these pigs for a while now, which means he probably is filthy and dirty. He's scrawny because he hasn't eaten. He's lost a bunch of weight. He probably stinks like pig crap. And when he comes home, father runs, hugs, kisses, tells the servants, bring the best robe. This is fascinating to me. The father doesn't make him get himself cleaned up before he puts the robe of the father upon him. It's almost like the father accepts him as he is. It's almost like if he told him, hey, you need to go bathe first and then we'll have a discussion about this and then you're welcome to my house. It's almost like it would be him saying, you need to be a certain way first before I'm willing to love and accept you. Which kind of, doesn't that sometimes seem to be the message of the church, whether we intend to or not? Doesn't it sometimes feel like we're going, hey, get your act together, and then you can come be a part of what's going on? 
Like I remember growing up, when, when I was younger, I was like in fifth or sixth grade, I remember several of my friends in church were getting baptized. I remember thinking, oh, well, you know, if they're doing it, I should probably do it, which is always a good reason to get baptized. Um, and, I'm, <laughs> and I remember thinking, well, my dad's a pastor, so that, there's like double pressure, which is always another reason to get baptized when your dad's a pastor, you know, all the things. And so I remember thinking like, well, if everyone's doing it, I should probably do it. But first, you know, like I should probably like get better at life. And so like, I, I, for like a couple months, I dedicated myself. I would sit in the front row at the church and I would take notes on everything my dad was saying. Like, is everybody seeing this? Look how good he's taking notes. And I would intentionally not sit with my friends because like they were idiots and I would get in trouble. And so I'm trying to pay attention. And then I would like try to like be a leader or an example in my Bible school class and try to memorize all the scriptures ahead of everybody. Because I was like, I was really wanting somebody to ask me to get baptized. <laughs> I thought if I could just like get my act together a little bit, maybe somebody would ask me to get baptized. Like what a ridiculous thought. Like how silly. It's really silly. Granted, I'm young, I'm stupid, you know, it happens. But like, isn't that the exact opposite message of Jesus? Isn't that the exact opposite message of grace? If I can get my act together, (laughs) do I need grace? (laughs) Do you know what I'm saying? Like it's weird. So the fact that he isn't told to bathe and change first to me is... Highly significant. The servants are just told, put the best robe on him. This to me speaks to the deep level of acceptance that the father has for the son. Not only that, but the servants are watching. And so they're taking their cues from the master. So however it is the father treats the son, they will follow suit. They're taking their cues from the master. So if he hesitates, if he pauses, if he dismisses, they will treat him accordingly. So this command to dress him in the best robe hopefully speaks to the son that you are welcome and you are part of the family. It also helps to assure the son's reconciliation both with the servants as well as the larger community. Now, along with this, with this whole scene, some scholars suggest that when Jesus tells, says the father put the best robe on him, that he, he might actually be referencing Isaiah 61.10, which says this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. Put the best robe on him and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. Yes, you stink. Yes, you smell. Yes, you are covered in pig crap, but I am going to robe you anyways. So the robe, in any case, is deeply significant to the story. Then you have the ring. Most people believe that this would have been some sort of signet ring, which means like it maybe had a family crest on it or something, but it's signifying that he is a part of this family. He's an heir to this father. It's not just a cool piece of jewelry. It's signifying, it's a visual reminder of the family's acceptance. So the robe, the ring, and then you have the sandals. Do you know who wears sandals? Not the servants. What was he trying to come home to be? just a hired servant. The sandals are a sign of him belonging to this place, of being one of the masters of the house, of being one of the free men of the house. Putting the sandals on serves as a sign that he is a part of this and will be a master to the other servants as well. So if the father running to the son, kissing the son, taking him under his protection wasn't enough to prove to the son, to prove to the servants, to prove to his village the status of the son, or the father's view of the son, then the robe and the ring and the sandals would serve to remove any doubt. Do you see how powerful of a story this is? Then what happens? Luke 15, 23, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. The killing of a fattened calf was a big deal. The killing of a fattened calf means it's a party. Not only is it a party, everyone's invited, because to kill a calf rather than a sheep would mean that the whole village was going to be invited, because they wouldn't kill an animal that large if it was going to rot and spoil because they didn't eat all of it. So if to kill a calf, they have enough people that will eat all the meat so it doesn't go bad, so it's not a waste of resources. And if they kill a calf and the whole village isn't invited, it's an offense to the community, right? So to kill the calf was to say there was something important. They they, they would kill a calf, they would slaughter a calf for like the marriage of 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 the oldest son, for the the visiting of like a high-ranking official. 
It was an indicator that something important was happening and there was something worth celebrating. It was an indicator that joy would to be, was to be had. So the purpose of killing the calf, of having this banquet, like for the father, was really about his desire to reconcile his son to the whole of the community. <laughs> like, this parable begins with this deep pre-existing love, and then it just keeps revealing more love, more grace, more acceptance. The Father loves, the Father protects, the Father invites, the Father restores. Like, is there anywhere in this story that we are even given a hint of the Father's displeasure? I mean, shouldn't the Son be punished for his behavior? Shouldn't the Son have to suffer the consequences of his behavior? Shouldn't the Son have to take ownership of his wrongdoings? Shouldn't the Son be judged for what he's done? Where is the judgment? Where is the justice? Where is the righteousness, righteousness and wrath of the Father? We don't really see that here, do we? Which is really weird, because in this parable that Jesus, who is the Son of God, tells that is written and found in the Bible, the Father loves, the Father gives, the Father forgives, the Father accepts, the Father restores, and the Father ushers the Son into the party. Hmm. Hmm, I say. Now, this does, of course, cause some problems for some people. Right? For one person in particular, of course, the older son, which is a bit weird if you think about it, but I kind of also get it. Right? We're going to get into the older son next week in, into some stuff. Um, so I'm going to keep this a bit brief. That There are some things that the interaction with the older son revealed to us about the father as well. Right? Like, the party kicks off. The older brother finds out about it. He's not super thrilled about it, which is fascinating. Like, he's just mad at the whole thing. He's mad at a party. Which, how do you get mad at a party? But he's mad because, like, how could the father just let the older brother back into the family? How could he just accept him like that? Because apparently some people get a bit bothered when people don't get what they deserve. And apparently some people get a, bo get a bit bothered when people get what they don't deserve. And, and apparently some people get a bit bothered when, like, somebody should be suffering, but they're not. Apparently some of us seem to live with the notion that if somebody maintains a different lifestyle than the one I have, then the father should have nothing to do with them. So the older brother gets a bit, about hot, gets a bit hot about the whole thing, and watch what he says, verse 28. <clears throat> the older brother became angry, refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him, but he... But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and you never, and never disobeyed your orders. You, uh, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. The brother is a bit hot about it. So again, we're going to look at the older son next week. But here's like five things worth pointing out. <laughs> just, just five and I've, this was a list of 30, so you're welcome. Um, number one, the party's already happening. The party's already happening. It says the older brother refused to go in. So who is it that's keeping him from the party? Who is it that's preventing, pre pre preventing him from celebrating the father's love, from celebrating the return of his brother? Who is it that's preventing him from, uh, from participating in this communal joy? It's only him. It's only his pride, his ego, that is keeping him out of the party. Number two, the cultural expectation of this time of the oldest brother, especially in this situation, was that he was expected to help host the party. So him not attending the party is sending a message. Him not fulfilling his role as host is sending a message. Essentially, it's this giant public middle finger to his father. This is what I think about all of you in this party. 
right? This is highly offensive that he's not participating in it. Number three, even when, with this great offense from the older son who he himself choose to, refused to go in, what does the father do? Verse 28 says, the father went to him and pleaded with him. So even though he's offended the father publicly, the father doesn't go and yell and curse and scream and threaten him to come back in or else. The father doesn't go out and berate him. The father doesn't go out and threaten to kick him out of the family so that he will forever be condemned to being separated from the father. It says he pleaded with him to come in. The word pleaded here is the word parakaleo, which means to call near, to invite, to invoke, to beseech. Right? There, there's a particular energy to this. There's an urgency. There is a weight to it. The father doesn't condemn or rebuke this child who is throwing a tantrum, which is what the audience at the time would have expected. Like, the father has to deal with this. Put the son in his place. Let him know what he's dealing with. The, 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 the older brother throws this fit. The older brother throws this fit, and the father is going, no, 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 I just want you to come in. So for the second time in this story, for the second time in this day, the father has gone out of his house to greet one of his sons who has gone through a particular situation or has offended him in some sort of way and at this great expense to himself demonstrates this unexpected love. All right, so what does the brother do? He continues, he's like throwing this fit. He, the, the younger brother accepts that he's accepted. The older brother begins to give all these reasons why he's upset, why he's choosing not to participate. And eventually he says, your son, he doesn't say my brother, he says, your son wasted his inheritance on prostitutes, and yet you throw him a party. Now, no, number four, last week we talked about how when it talks about the younger son's wild living, that the chances are that there wasn't anything to do with some sort of immorality, right, based on the context and how Jesus actually said this. So why then is the older, older brother accusing him of spending, wasting his money on prostitutes and in some sort of immoral living? Well, I'm glad you asked. If the older brother can convince his father that the younger brother is a rebellious son, there are certain consequences according to the Old Testament law that the father must enact. So it's not enough that he refuses to go into the party. It's not enough that, that he's throwing this little fit. He is now trying to cast this like shame, this blame onto the younger brother in order to stir up some tension there. So in Deuteronomy 18, it says this, if someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them when they discipline them, his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of his town. They shall say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all of the men of his town are to stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. All of Israel will hear of it and be afraid. You see, so he's trying to paint his brother in this light of being the rebellious son. He's so furious with the father's love and forgiveness of the younger brother. He doesn't just refuse to join the party. He wants to put his father in the position of having to kill his own son. It's like, <clears throat> it's like he's struggling to understand the reality of grace. It's like he's struggling to understand the reality of grace. I wonder if some of us struggle with this as, as well. So how does the father respond to this ridiculousness? Next verse, verse 31. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, do you remember how we talked about like the opening of the story would be like just an absurd, shocking beginning and the genius of what Jesus is doing here? This reply from the father is so brilliant. A couple of things with this. A couple of things. This is number five, but it's two parts, just so we're, if you're tracking. The older son is lamenting about 
how, 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 how hard it's been for him, all the things he's had to do. He, he's lamenting about the service to the father, about all the things he didn't get. And the father's response is like, well, but how could I give you anything more? If everything I already have is yours, like, it's already yours. You, you are the heir. It's, it's already yours. So the father's speech here is neither an apology for having the party and celebrating the fact that his son has come home and he has accepted him as he is, nor is it a rebuke or a condemnation of the older son who's struggling to come into the party. This speech of the father is a cry from deep within his heart that his son would know and understand his grace, that his son would know his generosity, that the son would know his acceptance. Everything I have is yours. It, it's, all, it's, already, it's already here. I, I, this is for you. It's all about wanting the son desperately to understand what the father is like. And it's like the older son completely misunderstands what it means to be the father's child. He misunderstands the love and generosity of the father. Somewhere along the lines, he got it in his head that he had to earn, that he had to work, that he had to do, that he had to prove. The son is the one who speaks and thinks of himself as the servant. The father sees him as an heir. He sees him as an heir with whom he gets to share everything he has with. The son is the one who sees himself as a servant. So the older brother is the one who prevents himself from joining the party, and he is the one that's putting himself in the role of servant. It's like he is the one that's creating his own re like false sense of reality. He is the one that's imposing his own less than status. He is the one that's living with this preconceived, like with this perception of, of a disconnect with the father. But this is not how the father actually is. This is not how the story prevent, pre presents the father. The father is giving and loving and forgiving and accepting. It's just that the older brother fails to see it. The second thing with this, and this is like a really interesting kind of like everything coming together, okay? The fact that the, the father humiliated himself publicly when he leaves to go plead with the older son that should be enough evidence for the older son about how much the father actually loves him. Because essentially, that act is the same act, the same demonstration of love that the father has for the younger son when he runs out of the house to protect him. So here he is again, for the second time today, demonstrating his love for one of his children that comes at a great expense to himself. But then, there's like this like hidden, like this hidden message in between the text here, okay? And this is what I think is really interesting. The older son is complaining that he couldn't even get a, a, a goat to celebrate with his friends. But the father is saying, yeah, 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 but also like everything is, is yours. Hey, everything I have is already yours. Now, what did we say about that little bit of rabbinic legislation earlier? Okay, that the father could gift the property to the sons, but it had to be done from a state of willingness, a voluntary act, under, under no duress from the family. The father could do this, he did this, which the younger son, like, doesn't really follow the rules here. He puts him under pressure and then he takes it and he does what he wants with it. But the older son, who is the rule follower, who is the rule keeper, who does everything right and legal, once the father broke up the property, the son still did not have access to it. And he's going to follow that law because he's the rule keeper. Which means, in order for this older son to do what he wants, in order for the older son to take the younger goat, in order for him to celebrate with his friends, the father would have to be dead. Which means, it doesn't actually say this straight out, but it's like this conversation is moving in this direction, trying to get us to see that where this is all headed is not that much different than where it all started with the younger brother's request. The only way for him to get the thing that he actually wants is to have the father die, which is not that much different than the younger son. Which is essentially say that the story has kind of come full circle. 
right? Like both sons break the heart of their father. And both times, the father offers them everything he has, right? When the father says, everything I have is yours, to the older brother, this is the same as when he says to the younger son, take my robe, take my ring, take the sandals. See, it's the same, it's the same story from different perspective. You see, Jesus in this parable is describing two like, ways of thinking, one, one of these brothers is like lawless without the law. The other brother, the older brother, is lawless with the law. Both sons rebel. Both break the hearts of their father. Both have separated themselves from the father. One does it physically. One does it spiritually. And yet in both situations, unconditional love and acceptance is demonstrated to both of them equally. This is a powerful parable. This, this has been like, if I'm honest, like this has been kind of messing with my brain this week. Like, I, I, I've been processing this and trying to sort through this. I've been a bit overwhelmed with it. Like, and, and the thing that kind of keeps standing out to me that I'm sorting through and wrestling with is like, did you notice that with the Father's love, like there was never any hoops to jump through? Isn't that weird? That there was never any hoops for the sons to, to jump through in order to receive their, their father's love. Both of the sons were lost in their own way and there were no hoops, there were no conditions, there were no steps to follow, there were no... The story begins in the reality of this pre-existing love of the father. The father gives the, the youngest son what he wants. The, the son makes a mess of things. The father has compassion in him, the stirring in the guts. He runs to him when he returns. He hugs him, he kisses him, he slaughters, and slaughters the fattened calf. He puts the robe on him, the ring on him, the sandals on him. He doesn't ask him to take a shower or get himself clean first, and we know the kid stinks like crap. The father sees him in his filth and puts the robe on him, throws a party. What did the son actually do? There were no hoops for him to jump through. And even with the older son, it's like the older son was creating his own hoops. He was creating his own conditions. And the father says, everything I have is yours. The party is here. It's now. It's already happening. I want you to be a part of it. Why do you keep putting up the hoops? Why do you keep getting in your own way? The hoops aren't mine. They're yours. It's weird. You see, and, and this parable ends like open-ended. We don't know what he ultimately chose to do. Did he go in? Did he stay out? We don't know. This reminds me a bit of like what Jesus said in Luke 7 that we've been using we played the pipe for you and you did not dance. The invitation is here. The party is happening. The, bride, the, the, the kingdom is among you. We don't know whether the son accepted the invitation or not. But we do know that in this parable that Jesus tells, the whole thing begins with this love and generosity and acceptance of the father. We know that the love and generosity and acceptance of the father is put on display over and over and over and we know that even at the end that is open-ended, what we still see is the love and generosity and acceptance of the Father. Which makes me think that if this is the story that Jesus chooses to tell people in order to explain and give us an idea of what the Father is like, it makes me think that if any of my thoughts and ideas concerning the Father are not rooted in love and generosity and acceptance, then that says more about me and my heart than it does about the Father. That says more about me than it does about the love of God. It would suggest to me then that I have not truly understood the Father because this whole story is love and generosity and acceptance. What a powerful, profound, eye-opening, kind of scary, kind of challenging parable. Wait a second. God can't just love everybody. <laughs> God can't just accept everybody. There has to be ways to keep people out or else we're not special. 
There has to be rules of who's allowed into the party or else then we're not as important. No. Love, acceptance, generosity. Come to the party. He's pleading, he's running, he's hugging, he's kissing, he's reconciling. He's doing all the things for both the brothers. He says, come, come to the party.